Okay, I'd like to start the day with you guys working through the FET simulation. So I'm going to do a little lecture, the classic lecture on uh, electromagnetic spectrum, which I'm sure you've all seen before. Of course, mine has a couple of uh, nuances in it that might be a little different, some things. Hopefully there's some things that you haven't heard before. But first, I want you to go through the FET simulation uh, activity. So go ahead, uh, pause this video, work through that activity as much as you can. When you get down to the reading part, if you want to replay or start this video back up, uh, that would be a good time. The standard electromagnetic radiation lecture. Here we go. Electromagnetic waves are actually deal with two things, electricity and magnetism. No secret there, it's in the name. So every electromagnetic wave is created the same way. We're, I'm gonna talk about a ton of different types of waves today. I'm gonna talk about a whole spectrum of electromagnetic waves. All of them are the exact same thing. It, uh, they're, they're created the same way, they move the same way, they react the same way with uh, uh, you know, different materials. So how do you create an electromagnetic wave? Well, you take a charge. Uh, it could be a proton, could be an electron, could be anything, and you vibrate it up and down. Now, an electromagnetic wave is created just like any other wave. It starts with a vibration. It starts with a, uh, some kind of a vibration. In this case, it's the vibration of a charge. If you take a charge and you vibrate it, you create an electromagnetic wave. And that wave looks like this. You'll notice here, we have two different fields, two different uh, fields that are moving through space. Uh, you have an electric field, and perpendicular to that, you have a magnetic field. This is going up and down, this is going in and out of the board. There's some uh, fancy drawing here. We know that uh, electricity and magnetism have some perpendicular aspects to them. Well, the electromagnetic wave is no different. You have an oscillating electric and magnetic field. That's what we consider electromagnetic radiation. Um, at least today. Uh, we'll talk later about photons uh, and how that works. But for today, we're going to talk about them as oscillating electric and magnetic fields. All of the waves I'm going to talk about today, every single one, travels at the same speed. They travel at the speed of light. Now the speed of light is fast. Uh, 300 million meters per second. 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. There's probably two numbers in this class that I want you to memorize. One is G, the 9.8 uh, meters per second squared is acceleration of gravity. The second one is the speed of light, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. That's fast. When I snap my fingers, it takes time for the sound to get to you. Now it travels 343 meters per second, three and a half football fields every second. That's pretty fast. Um, we don't even think about it if you're in the room. The only time we ever think about sound is you know, maybe with an echo if you uh, have a big canyon or something. Uh, you could actually hear that, uh, or maybe at a baseball field when you see the swing of the bat and then you hear it hit uh, a half a second later, a firework. You see it go off and then you hear it. That's because it takes time for the sound to get to you. In the time it takes the sound to get to you when I snap my fingers, light can travel around the earth a couple of times. It's fast. It's so fast that we don't even, in space, we don't even, uh, we, we don't even think about uh, the speed of light and our distances in terms of meters and, and kilometers anymore. If you want to travel to the sun, it's 150 million miles. That's a lot, right? But if we're looking at distances in space, we're looking at things that are like 150 million, like that's a lot of decimals. So a lot of times we want a, a, a unit that makes a little bit more sense. So uh, here's what we look at in space, and I think it's kind of cool. It takes, does anybody know how long it takes light to get from the moon to Earth? Like the moon's pretty far away. It took us three days in our spaceship. To get to the moon, it takes light about one second. About one second. We would say that the moon is about one light second away. Okay, does that make sense? That being a distance, a light second. Traveling 300 million meters per second, it takes one second to get to the moon. It takes us three days. Uh, the sun. The sun, it's interesting, is about 8.3 light minutes away, meaning it takes 8.3 minutes for light to get from the sun to us. That's about 1 AU, we call it in astronomy. We would say the sun's about 8.3 light minutes away, right? 
we wouldn't, you know, 150 million miles is, uh, is uh, you know, that's a, a huge number. Uh, so if it takes, so let, think about that a second. If the sun blew up right now, when would we know about it? Well, we would know 8.3 light minutes later, right? Or 8.3 minutes later. In fact, we would still be going around the sun. Gravity, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Gra that, the idea that gravity is, is tugging on us would continue to happen for eight minutes. And then the sun, if it disappeared, we would go off on a tangent. It's really kind of an interesting thing, the speed of light. Eight light minutes is a really long time. Mars is about half again the distance of the sun as we are. So it's about, at closest, it's about four light minutes away. Okay, about four light minutes away. Which makes, you know, uh, calling Mars kind of a boring conversation. Because you would say, hey, uh, Houston, we have a problem. And if they're on Mars, you have to wait four minutes for Houston to hear, Houston, we have a problem. And then Houston's like, what's the problem? So if you're on Mars and there's a problem, it's an eight minute conversation. And that's if you're closest. If you're on the other side of the sun, it could be a 20 minute delay in conversation because it takes that much time for the light to get there. So Earth to Mars is about four light minutes away. What about the closest star to us that's not the sun? The closest star to us that's not the sun is actually called Alpha Centauri, or uh, yeah, it's called Proxima Centauri, okay, or Alpha Centauri. Uh, their uh, double star kind of goes like this. Um, I'm not sure which one's closest to us right now. But uh, it's about 3.26 light years away. It takes us about six to eight months to get to Mars, four light minutes. How long do you think it takes us to get a light year? A year for light is a really long time. In fact, it would take us in our spaceships about 10,000 years to get one light year. And Alpha Centauri is 3.26 light years away. That's a long ways. That's like a 35,000 uh, you know, year trip to get there. At this, and that's going, this, that's going the speed of light. We can't go the speed of light. Or, I mean, that's going our, our, regular, uh, our regular speed. If we could go the speed of light, it would still take 3.26 years. That's the closest star to us. Betelgeuse is a really big star. It's 500 light years away. 500 light years away. That means there were kings and castles and knights and damsels in distress when, when light left Betelgeuse. It's been traveling for 500 years. And then you can finally see it. If Betelgeuse blew up today, we wouldn't know for 500 years. Polaris, the North Star, is 650 light years away. Well, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. That was around the time light left, Siri, or left uh, uh, Polaris. It's been traveling for 650 years and then we finally see it. The farthest thing we can see with the naked eye is actually not a star. This is without a telescope. The farthest thing you can see is actually not a star, but a galaxy. The closest galaxy to us called Andromeda. It is 2.2 million light years away. Now, what does that mean? That means it's taken light 2.2 million years to get here from those stars. Humans were living in caves, hunting and gathering, and doing all that stuff when light left Andromeda. It's been traveling for 2.2 million years, and then we finally see it. That's with the naked eye. If we use telescopes, we can see farther. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is, of course, one of the best telescopes that we have nowadays. Uh, and uh, it, they did something that, you know, we, uh, we hadn't done before uh, when Hubble went up. Uh, Hubble went up, they, they decided they would take a picture of space where there's nothing there. They just pointed it right above the Big Dipper, uh, just about with nothing there, okay? And, and so a lot of scientists were like, this is stupid, why are we spending all this money and, and telescope time is very expensive to just point it at nothing? And the other guys were like, ah, let's try it. So they did. So they opened the, the lens up or they opened the, the mirror up for like, uh, I don't know, three days. And they took all kinds of different pictures, uh, just a three day exposure. Uh, up, it's called the Hubble Deep Field View. And what it did, if you take your, pit, your thumb and you hold it out like this, your thumbnail covers a certain part of the sky. If you took your thumbnail and cut it into about 60 different pieces, 1 60th of your thumbnail is about the amount of sky they took a picture of. So it's a very, very tiny part of the sky. And it was above the Big Dipper, kind of off axis of the Milky Way, so there wasn't a lot of 
uh, extra space and or extra dust and stuff in the way. And they wanted to see as far as we've ever seen. This is what they saw. Every speck of light on this document is not a star, it's a galaxy. A galaxy of up to 200 billion stars. On average, actually, 200 billion stars. This is 1 60th of your pinky nail in space. The universe is a really big place. We actually start charting these galaxies and charting galaxies uh, all over the universe to kind of get a feel for what is the universe. And uh, it's called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And I'll put a link to it uh, underneath this if you're interested. Uh, it's a really cool thing. This is actual real data uh, for uh, the, um, the universe, the known universe that we have right now. So, electromagnetic radiation all travels at the speed of light. 300 million meters per second. You vibrate charge to create an oscillating electric and magnetic field that travels this fast. Now, what happens if you vibrate it slowly? Or what happens if you vibrate it quicker? Well, if that's the case, we run into what's called the electromagnetic spectrum. Every wave I'm going to talk about here in the next couple of minutes is the exact same wave. We vibrated a charge up and down that created an oscillating electric and magnetic field. They all travel at the speed of light. The only difference I'm going to talk about here, the only difference I'm going to talk about is how fast the frequency that I vibrated. Uh, which then, of course, the wavelength. If you vibrate faster, the wavelength gets smaller. We're going to start with vibrating really, really slow. Okay. In fact, we're going to go about 60 times a second. If we go 60 times a second, I want to look at uh, a cord. So here in the United States, we have, uh, we have alternating current. Alternating current is going back and forth, back and forth. And in the United States, it's about 60 times a second. That is vibrating charge. That creates what we call a power wave. Power waves are very, very low energy. Uh, the wavelength of these things are on the size of mountains. I mean, they're, it's a huge, if you take 300 million, it being the speed, divided by 60, it's going to be a huge number of meters, like the size of the Earth. So power waves are very, very low energy. You, you hardly ever hear about them. The only time you ever hear about them is like if you live under a power line, like under a power, near a power station, and there's some talk about, uh, you know, high intensity power waves and linking that to cancer and those kinds of things, but uh, uh, birth defects. Uh, but those are power waves. If you vibrate a little, that's 60 times a second. If you vibrate a little faster into the thousands of times a second, you get what's called AM radio waves. AM radio stands for amplitude modulation. And so what you do is uh, you vibrate this charge and then all of a sudden you make a big amplitude, big amplitude, big amplitude, and those big amplitudes tell the speaker to go back and forth. So they send this wave through space, this is actually how all radio and TV work, and in fact your cell phone very, very closely, they vibrate this thing at a certain frequency, let's say they do 600,000 times a second. And in that 600,000 times a second, every once in a while, they're going to give you a big amplitude. That's the signal. That big amplitude is the signal. Amplitude modulation. So the 600,000 times a second is the frequency. That's what you tune your radio into. So your radio, the antenna in your radio starts to vibrate. Uh, the, actually, the electrons in your antenna start to vibrate at 600,000 times a second. And then it picks up how big that am those amplitudes come in. That's what gives the signal to your speaker to go back and forth. AM radio. So if you turn into 600 AM, that's in kilohertz. So 600,000 times a second. If you look at uh, 600, or 3 times 10 to the 8th divided by 600,000, you're still getting uh, hundreds and hundreds of meters, uh, 1,000 meters as your wavelength. It's still a very, very large wavelength, um, but we're in kilohertz. We're in kilohertz. So those AM radio stations, 800 AM or 1600 AM, is 1,600,000 times a second that they are vibrating. And then they adjust the amplitudes. FM is in megahertz. FM, uh, it all, the only difference is that you're vibrating the electrons in the tower at the radio station at millions of times a second instead of thousands of times a second. Uh, FM stands for frequency modulation. So what they do is they slightly change the frequency uh, as, to send the signal. 
So in that, since you're vibrating the thing so fast, you can send actually two signals at the same time. You can send a signal to the left speaker, you can send a signal to the right speaker, and you can tell them to do different things. And that's how you get stereo out of FM. You can't get stereo out of AM because it doesn't have enough vibrations in order to send two signals. Just above FM is XM radio, uh, the satellite radio stuff. Um, and just above that is TV, about twice FM. FM stops at uh, 107.9. So if you're tuning into, uh, you know, 90, 99.7 FM, that's 99.7 million times a second they are vibrating their electrons, which is different than 103.7 FM, which is 103.7 million times a second. So your radio tunes out the 103.7 if you want to tune in to 99.7. TV is about twice that, that you can send, uh, and I'm talking about the old rabbit ears TV. Uh, they send a digital signal now, but back in my day we used to have rabbit ears on top of our TV. Uh, and so then you can send left speaker, right speaker, and a visual information on that. Just over uh, TV is microwaves. Uh, microwaves, uh, of course, uh, are most famous for being a microwave and, and uh, heating up food. And let me tell you how that works. So microwaves actually are just the right frequency to vibrate a certain molecule. And the molecule that is absorbs microwaves really well is water. Most organic things like myself and the mac and cheese that I'm eating or the hot pocket that I'm heating up has a lot of water in it. So when that uh, microwave goes in, it actually hits the water molecule it gets absorbed and that water molecule starts to vibrate, which actually creates heat, uh, which then heats up uh, your food. So microwaves actually deal with heating up water. That's the key. There's a really cool experiment you can do. So take your microwave and take a piece of cardboard. Cut the piece of cardboard to be exactly the same size as your microwave uh, and put it in there and then cover it with marshmallows, just the little marshmallows, and turn your microwave on for about 15 seconds. And what you'll see, and this is kind of cool, you'll see lines of marshmallows that are melted, not melted, melted, not melted. Because what you get in a microwave is actually you get a standing wave. A microwave has a wavelength of about 10 centimeters, somewhere in here. This is about where we're at right now. FM radio is actually about the size of the room, about three meters-ish. Uh, but microwave is about 10 centimeters. So what you get is you get anti-nodes and nodes in your microwave, okay? Um, and if you measure between two anti-nodes, you just got half a wavelength. So now you know the wavelength of your microwave. And if you look on the back of your microwave, you can find the frequency of your microwave. And from that, you can calculate the speed of light and you'll be within like five, five or six percent. It's actually really cool. But it also tells us why we have to turn our food in the microwave. You have to turn your food in the microwave because there are hot spots and cool spots in terms of anti-nodes and nodes that are about, you know, five centimeters apart. So you turn your food so that your food gets cooked evenly inside your microwave. So that's kind of cool. Right after microwaves are infrared. Actually, before I go there, cell phones actually act on microwaves. Uh, that's the, the wavelength for cell phones. And when they chose to do cell phones in microwaves, it was actually a pretty good idea because if they did it with FM or they did it with AM, you wouldn't have enough vibrations to send the amount of signals that we want to send today. We want to send video. We want to send, uh, you know, uh, to, you know, video calls and things like that. And so we have to have enough of a uh, vibration of those charges in order to send those kinds of signals. So they actually, cell phones actually operate in the microwave frequency. That doesn't mean you can cook your food with a cell phone uh, because it's not the same exact thing that you would do in a microwave oven, but uh, it is in that frequency range. Above microwaves is infrared. Infrared, of course, is heat. If you look at my body, I have charges in me. I have electrons in the atoms, and those electrons are vibrating back and forth. Uh, and that happens to be at the infrared frequency. So I'm creating electromagnetic radiation that's coming out of me. Uh, if you've seen Predator, or if you've ever seen uh, anything to do with infrared imaging, you'll know that I'm giving off infrared radiation. My hands, not so much because they're a little cooler, but here in the middle of my body, I'm giving off that radiation. Um, that's how the, you know, you, those temperature guns work. Uh, you know, you got those little like infrared temperature guns that they point at you to take your temperature for COVID. Uh, they're reading the radiation that's coming off of you and turning that into a temperature. 
So infrared is uh, electromagnetic waves. It's the oscillating electric and magnetic field that's coming off of objects that are at the temperature of things around you. Uh, myself, the, the table, these kinds of things happen to have electrons that are vibrating in that frequency. Right above infrared is a very, very small part of the spectrum. It's like one ten thousandth of the spectrum, which we call visible light. The only thing that makes visible light important, the only thing that makes it really cool for us is that the rods and the cones in the back of our eye happen to be attuned to it. If we were on another planet and another thing and, and whatever, you know, a different species, that might not be the case and we would care very little about visible light. But we care a lot about visible light because that's the electromagnetic radiation that we have sensors for in our body. So, uh, it's so important we break it into its own spectrum. So if you go to the longer wavelengths of visible light to the shorter wavelengths, that's how we get colors. Uh, you start with reds, orange, yellows, greens, blues, indigos, violets. Uh, that whole Roy G. Biv thing. Um, that is an acronym that's supposed to be Colors of the Rainbow. They're really not, like, everybody asks, like, why do they have indigo in there? Well, that's because they wanted a vowel. Like, there's really, it's actually a spectrum. They just mention those colors to give you an idea of the kinds of colors that are in there. But truly, there's billions and billions and infinite number of um, uh, spectrum of colors inside the... Uh, uh, electromagnetic, uh, the color rainbow. So that's visible light. Uh, and like I said, the only, it travels at the speed of light, it's the same as everything else, the exact same thing as radio waves. It's just vibrated a little faster and we are attuned to it. Okay? Right above visible light is UV. UV is ultraviolet. Uh, ultraviolet light, we get a lot of ultraviolet light coming from the sun um, or like black lights or something that you have, uh, tanning beds, those kinds of things. And UV is, of course, most famous for your suntan or your skin cancer. So let's talk about how that works. When uh, your skin uh, has cells in it, we'll talk about a little biology, those cells have all those little organelles, and one of them is the nucleus. And in the nucleus, you have chromosomes. And in the chromosomes, you have DNA. And if you remember from biology, DNA is that double helix of nucleotides. You've got the adenines and the guanines and all that kind of stuff. So this helix of nucleotides is in there. So if ultraviolet light hits your skin, that nucleus with the DNA in it, uh, ultraviolet light has enough energy to actually pop off one of those adenines or guanines. It just, it can knock one of them off of there. Now, is that a good deal or not? Well, chances are no, like who cares? Like most of the time, 99.999% of the time, it's not a big deal. Uh, you, the cell might die. Uh, in fact, your skin cells die all the time. If I go like this, I probably just lost a couple of hundred cells. Uh, dust, actually, if you uh, think about dust, dust is actually something like 90% dead skin. That's really gross. Think about your sheets. Wash your sheets. Um, so dead skin, they, it dies all the time. Usually not a big deal. Um, however, if you knock off the wrong adenine or guanine or thymine, if you knock off the wrong one, the one that has to do with transcription or the replication of the DNA, that cell can start to multiply out of control. And that's what we call melanoma. It becomes a little spot on your skin and it can spread to the rest of your body and then you can have real problems. 99.999% of the time, it's not a big deal, but once in a while, uh, you know, if you hit the wrong one, that can be, that's what we call skin cancer. Now this happens every single time you go outside. Anytime you are exposed to electromagnetic radiation, or I'm sorry, uh, UV radiation, this can happen. We wear sunblock because that sunblock will absorb the UV uh, and not uh, get it to our cells. Uh, why do we always yell about people that, you know, are concerned about people that are spending all the time on the beach or in tanning beds and stuff? Well, it's just because they're rolling the dice more often, okay? Uh, when you walk out to your car after school today, you could get skin cancer, technically. Uh, there's a very, very small chance of it. Above UV is what we call X-rays. X-rays actually uh, are uh, uh, the same thing as UV, a little bit higher energy as UV. But let's talk a little bit about transparent and opaque. Transparent means that the wave will move right through it. Okay, so the wave moves directly through it. Uh, you saw this. Uh, actually, you'll see this in the next uh, activity. Um, opaque means that it's absorbed or reflected from it. So here's how an x-ray works. What you do 
is you take a film and the film is black or it's white but it turns black when an x-ray hits it. Then you put your hand up here and you shoot the x-ray at it. The x-ray will go through your skin and your muscles but it will leave a shadow of your bones because your bones are opaque to x-rays. This is what the dentist does when you go to the dentist and they put that thing in your mouth. They, that thing behind, that's the film. They just put the film in your mouth and then they shoot the x-ray through and it leaves the imprint on the film. The uh, hygienist always kind of goes in the other room and hits the button and they put this big leather vest or this, uh, this big vest on you, the, the it's an iron vest or a lead vest on you. That's because they want to protect you from ambient x-rays that are flying through. And if you think about it, what are they trying to protect? Well, they are protecting your heart, they're protecting your lungs, they're protecting all those things, but the, kind of the biggest thing they're protecting with that is actually your mommy daddy parts. Because think about this, if you knock off an adenine or a guanine in your heart, like one cell in your heart and they knock these things off, uh, is that a big deal? Well, no, the cell's probably gonna die, it's no big deal. It's probably not even one of the, it might've been one of the adenine or guanines that had to do with the shape of your nose. Who cares on that piece of cell? Because every cell has the DNA for your entire body. But what if you knocked off an adenine or a guanine on either a sperm or an egg cell? Well, if you do that, even if you knocked off the one that had to do with the nose and that, one, that cell becomes your child, every cell in your child will have that defect. That's what they're really trying to protect with that. Yeah, they're protecting your heart and your lungs, but for the most part, they're protecting your gametes, your, your mommy daddy parts, um, because any change to that DNA is gonna have big ramifications to your children. The last type of electromagnetic radiation is called gamma. Gamma, actually, we're up to the point with, with x-rays and gamma, we're actually vibrating nucleons. We're actually vibrating the nucleus. It has to vibrate that fast in order to get it. So these are actually nuclear things. We make x-rays with cesium nuclei. Uh, gamma is created in the sun, uh, you know, with nuclear fusion and all this, we create gamma. It's created through uh, radioactive decay when nuclei spread apart, all these kinds of things, nuclear bombs. This is gamma. Uh, gamma will, uh, is pretty much transparent to everything. I think it takes like six feet of lead to stop a gamma ray. Uh, you have gamma rays going through you right now. They don't bother you at all. Uh, there's only really two times I ever hear about gamma rays actually uh, doing anything. Uh, the first one's after a nuclear bomb. In the nuclear explosion, you have high intensity gamma rays, like it's very intense. And that's what actually fries everything within the first like mile. Uh, everything gets fried at the you can't run from it. It's the speed of light. It fry and then after about a mile, it's actually is spread out enough that uh, it's now lower intensity gamma rays and and things are fine. They'll still hit you, uh, but it's not as big of a deal. The other place I hear about gamma rays, which is really cool, is called the gamma knife. And what it is is it's a cancer treatment for brain cancer. So what they do is they lay you down on this bed. And they, well actually, let's say you have a brain tumor, okay? You have a brain tumor, let's say sitting in here. They take some MRIs to get an exact idea of where this brain tumor is. They used to have one of these over at uh, uh, Genesis East, uh, but I think they get something new now. But uh, anyway, you have this brain tumor in here. So what they do is they, sit, they, they put this helmet on you. They like, you know, put a couple of screws here and a couple of screws here, uh, and then they put this helmet on you. And then they lay you on this bed and they shoot a gamma ray. The helmet kind of sticks into this really big helmet and they shoot a gamma ray right through the tumor. And what happens? Nothing. Well, I just told you, gamma rays go through everything, not a big deal. But then what they do is as that gamma ray is going, they shoot another one that crosses it and another one and another one. And they all cross in constructive interference. They all cross and make super gamma ray at one spot. And it's about a millimeter in diameter. And if that super gamma ray inside your head is strong enough to actually affect material. So it doesn't affect material as the rays are coming, but where they cross at about one millimeter in diameter, they can actually affect material. So then they move you around and eat the cancer out from the inside. They actually uh, burn it out from the inside. It's like a little lightsaber in there. In fact, it's so hot that it, there's no internal bleeding because it's cauterizing the wounds. It's burning shut any blood vessels that it actually hits inside the brain. This is amazing. If you think about like normal brain surgery, you go in, they have to cut your head open, they have to go in and they have to grab the stuff. And it's very invasive, extremely invasive. This is outpatient. 
You go in in the morning, you have this procedure done, you go home at night. Three, four, five weeks later, they take some more MRIs to see if they got everything. If they didn't, you come back and you do it again. And they eat this thing out from the inside, and then your white blood cells and all those kinds of things just take away the, the junk that's still in there. It's amazing uh, the kinds of things that they can do now. So, all the way from power waves up to gamma rays is what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. Wow. <laughs>